I was thinking about a problem with the use of the term female supremacy. Feminism is the pursuit of female supremacy, but it's a concept many people struggle with because it sounds extreme. Supremacy sounds grand and powerful, striking and dominant, clearly unjust and oppressive when prepended by any group. A bit like this. It had become, in short, an England completely dominated by the female sex. Even the Union Jack had now become the Union Jill, a sad travesty of its former self. But of course it's not really like that. So what is meant by female supremacy? How does it describe the ardent desires of feminists and the more ordinary desires of women? Female supremacy is not always obvious, like bias towards women in the family court, or exemption from selective service, or unfair allocation of healthcare resources, etc. Rather than a clenched fist, it's more often like a concealed gun in the room. It's not in your face, but rather hidden in plain view. Female supremacy is soft and suffocating. It's about women being favoured and handed advantage or victory over men on every occasion possible. Women must win and be seen to win. Men, of course, enable and promote this behaviour by offering no resistance to the demands of women and the state. So what does female supremacy look like? The principal issue with Donglegate is that it was a convention under a code of conduct written by feminists. Therefore, each and every woman in attendance was essentially the equivalent of a card-carrying feminist. The code of conduct was wrapped around every female at the convention in a way that perhaps Batfink could explain best. My wings are like a shield of steel. Every interaction between men and women under a feminist written code of conduct is subject to the ludicrous feminist ideas of man as oppressor and woman as victim. Which reinforces rape culture, which is part of patriarchy. So from the moment Pycon adopted the feminist policy, the convention became a mini patriarchy with women suffering for being women at all times. So naturally, any offence taken by a woman could only be justified and must be punished. The men's joke in this case was not worthy of reprimand and any sensible person knows it. Can I use a dongle with this? Does it make you uncomfortable when I use the word dongle? Her complaint shouldn't have been entertained, but it was because it was a feminist view of the men's private interaction, which allows nothing to pass between men that any woman anywhere might take offence to, at any time, for any reason. Even if that interaction was not sufficiently offensive in itself to upset anybody except the excessively sensitive. The joke was clearly not the issue. It was a woman feeling offended which was the issue. The men could have been making a joke about, I don't know, firing a squirrel from a catapult, or being mean to orphans, or whatever. The PyCon staff would have responded in the same way. The enforcement of a feminist policy simply equates to woman offended equals man at fault. Any woman a man sits next to is empowered in that very unhealthy way we've all come to understand. It's unlikely, but she can do it if she likes. The code of conduct targeting men is primed and ready for her use, and if you're in her blast radius and you're male, you will pay the price. This is female supremacy. So you didn't get the job, huh? We need to make further progress on fairness, and that's why we will legislate to give more scope for employers if they want to increase the number of women or black or Asian employees to take positive action. Legally sanctioned and encouraged discrimination against men in hiring practices means that if you go up against a woman who is equally qualified, she gets the job and you don't. Every time. Why? Because she says she's oppressed, and we all submit to her victim status. Every time. That is female supremacy. In the UK, what used to be called the Boy Scouts organisation is required to admit girls. Why? Because women demanded it, saying that it's discrimination to restrict membership to boys. However, in contrast, the Girl Guides refuses to admit boys. Why? Because those same women, fully aware of their hypocrisy and vile disregard for the welfare of boys, say that girls require a safe space for themselves away from boys. This is female supremacy. Tickets to the Wimbledon men's final cost £3,250. The women's final costs £965. Yet prize money for both sexes is equal. Add to this that men are required to play much more tennis than women, with men playing the best of five sets and women playing only the best of three. And that men play tennis at a much higher standard than women. And that the requirement for men to play more tennis means that most male players have no time left to play in the other events like the doubles meaning that women are able to earn much more than men at events. With all this, what you end up with is very clear, multifaceted discrimination against men in professional tennis. Yet, we pay women equal prize money because of the usual pattern of women complaining and men attending to that complaint. 
Women complained that it was discrimination against women to pay men more for their greater ability, their greater number of sets played, and their greater audience appeal. And men agreed. When we so clearly discriminate against men, yet women still complain about discrimination against women and unjustly succeed in their complaint, that is female supremacy. A woman costs a man 10 years of his life due to a false rape accusation. She's not prosecuted nor required to give back the money she was awarded for the rape that never happened. The media has not so much as a harsh word for her and only ponders the question of, should she be prosecuted? You couldn't make it up, but this is female supremacy. The girls go to college and the boys go to jail. Women significantly outnumber men in universities and have for many years. Yet universities still provide no unique men's resources, no men's offices, no men's departments, no men's advice centres. Women, however, are oversupplied with services aimed to help them somehow overcome their numerical superiority on campus. Where female advantage is honoured and male disadvantage is ignored, that is female supremacy. It's already public government policy to not sentence women as severely as men for a given crime. But when we actually contemplate closing women's prisons, and I predict this will be instituted in the UK within five years, with the reasoning that when a woman commits a crime, it's somehow less criminal than when a man commits that same crime, and at the same time we wax lyrical about how women are at least equal to and typically superior to men in all fields imaginable, including morally superior, that is female supremacy. The book has four main messages for men. The first is help women sit at the table, help women reach for opportunities. Despite all of the progress women have made, we are nowhere close to having our share of the leadership roles. Where a woman can be at the top in industry, yet still behave as if she were at the bottom and ask for more for herself, or at least for her sisters, that is female supremacy. And in order to allow progress on women's representation in the House to continue, we'll extend the permission for all women shortlists for parliamentary selection until 2030. Where we potentially encourage the advancement of substandard people into our government, and where we also deny the advancement of better candidates under the mantra that it's to our benefit when women advance without merit. That is female supremacy. When men walk a mile in her shoes while she watches him do it, yet it wouldn't occur to her, or to him, for her to walk so much as a single step in his. That is female supremacy. When legislation is drafted for the benefit of women and to the exclusion of men. Where women are catered to exclusively in our governments and men ignored. Where one woman behind one desk can throw the basic human rights of male students and only male students into the dustbin. And where all proposed legislation is scrutinised for any negative effects on women before being signed into law, but no such care is taken for its negative effects on men. That is female supremacy. Endless tough women on our screens, juxtaposed with helpless women. Now you come on now, or you're gonna regret it later. So she can show up with fresh bruises later in. And never a missed opportunity for bad men to be taught the error of their ways towards women by one of a few good men. The good man will beat the bad man and stand up for women. Every major show or film will feature domestic violence by a man, or a deadbeat dad, or both. So it is written in Hollywood, so it shall be shown on our screens. That is female supremacy. When women sexually abuse young boys, and it's called an affair, and when they sexually abuse girls with objects, well, then it becomes merely a lesbian affair. Women tend to use objects. Uh, broom handles, bottles. One woman said that, that uh, she was sexually abused by rose stems with the thorns still on being stuck up. Um, women can be quite cruel using objects, but they're still after their own sexual gratification. And yet we still only choose to move men away from children on aircraft because women are the kinder, gentler, safer sex then that, most assuredly, is female supremacy. So we can see that we don't need to look forward to, or dread, the future of female supremacy, because that future is already here. Feminism pursues female supremacy with single-minded determination. It relies on a relatively small number of hateful leaders and a huge number of useful and willful idiots. It is implacable and relentless. No advance made by women is enough. No advantage given to women is enough. Men cannot capitulate enough. 
Women simply demand more and more and more, indefinitely, with no end point, forever. Ask yourself honestly, is this the behaviour of a woman oppressed or a woman oppressor?